On their left is Patrick who is, of course, the president of the Media Institute, who appears here on his own behalf uh, to voice his own views, uh, controversial as always, uh, and uh, protected by the First Amendment uh, as, uh, as always. Patrick, uh, you've written, but I'd like you to uh, uh, speak to it, uh, uh, to express your views on the administration effectively, and I use those words uh, because the administration did not use the words, in so many words, take it down, but effectively asked uh, that, that this be taken down, um, and also uh, expressed criticism uh, publicly uh, of the film uh, at the same time uh, as it uh, said, and, and the president even more clearly at the UN, said uh, that this is, this is the way we live under the First Amendment, is that such speech uh, is protected. But I'm interested, and I think the audience would be interested in your views as to whether the administration should have, A, criticized the film, even in the context uh, that, that I've set forth, and B, whether it should have urged Google to take it down. Well. Um Given that I am, as, a, as, as Floyd said, the always controversial member of this panel, I feel a certain obligation to live up to my reputation. So uh, with that, um, let me say, well, first let me say uh, how grateful I am to Floyd and the, these panelists and the panelists uh, that will follow, um, Bruce Brown, their moderator, and how pleased I am with the Motion Picture Association. Uh, for their general support and for their use of this facility. Um, <clears throat> this very program is the Media Institute's Salute to Free Speech Week, a program that, uh, a national program that we helped launch and that is dear to our heart. Um, <clears throat> may I also say quickly that uh, if you haven't read the foreign policy piece that's been referred to here, that was co-authored by Susan Benish and Rebecca McKinnon, I recommend it to you. It's, I would say that it's a call for greater transparency on the part of Google, and uh, particularly with regard to what they refer to as Google's uh, de facto jurisprudence, a turn of phrase that I particularly liked, uh, by the way. The, um, uh, but, but with your indulgence, I'd like to, to, to make a few general observations uh, uh, sort of on the periphery of the specific subject of this uh, panel. I wonder how many of you remember Jared Loeffner. <coughs> uh, but Mr. Loeffner was the man who, in Tucson about a year ago, shot and killed six people and gravely wounded Representative Gabriel Giffords. It was only hours after the shooting that some in the media and in government began to link Loeffner's crime to hate speech. Paul Krugman, uh, for instance, wrote, so wrote these words, so will the Arizona massacre make our discourse less toxic? It's really up to GOP leaders. Will they accept the reality of what's happening to America and take a stand against eliminationist rhetoric? Or will they try to dismiss the massacre as the mere act of a deranged individual? And on Capitol Hill, Representative Bob Brady told Broadcasting and Cable Magazine that he was working on a bill to make it a crime to use language or symbols that could be interpreted as inciting violence um, against a member of Congress. Representative Edward Markey said that the shooting in Arizona reminds all of us that the coarsening of our public discourse can have tragic consequences. And the representative James Clyburn said that he saw in the shooting in Tucson the need for reinstatement of the fairness doctrine. The fairness doctrine. Unfortunately for all of the, those people who saw or wanted to see a link between heated political rhetoric and Loeffner's actions, it turned out on further examination <clears throat> that Loeffner didn't have a political bone in his body, that he wasn't moved to act because of heated political rhetoric, but because of the awful demons that live inside his head. 
So too with the Innocence of Muslims video, a production made by an individual and distributed alongside millions of other user-supplied uh, user videos on YouTube. Despite the claims that issued from the State Department and the White House, it is now known and acknowledged, I believe, that the YouTube video had nothing to do with the slaying of the American ambassador and the other Americans in Libya. And so one of the points that I think we should take away from this and from the Loeffner affair is that we should be wary of claims that speech has caused politically motivated crimes. But I would have been unhappy with the official statements that is the government statements even if the YouTube video had been responsible for those crimes. The Innocence of Muslims <clears throat> was not produced by the government, nor by any private sector institution. It was produced by an individual citizen of a country that guarantees the free expression of unpopular and even detested ideas. Indeed, these are precisely the kinds of expression that need protection. So it seems to me that the official statements that might accompany any future such crime, even if it was sparked by hateful speech, uh, should stress this point, that the statements of individual Americans are theirs alone and not those of the government, and that this principle that we have of free speech, this bedrock principle, is something that despite its frequently unsettling effects, is something we are proud of as a country. You know, in this country, we've developed quite a cottage industry around the, around the educational discipline that goes by the name of uh, media literacy. And so it seems to me that perhaps this might be something that the State Department <clears throat> might want to explore for export in some fashion to countries around the world, and especially to those without free speech who see, uh, whose, uh, who's, uh, 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 citizens may not understand the way the media, particularly the American media, uh, work. It's my understanding that UNESCO has had some little experience with, with this concept. Lastly, I'd like to say a word about so-called hate speech generally. I am vastly more concerned about the efforts to curtail or contain it than I am about the speech itself. Not long after the killings in Libya, the Los Angeles Times ran an op-ed piece <clears throat> uh, written by a former NPR reporter in which she argued incorrectly that the innocence of Muslims video led to the death of the U.S. ambassador and was not entitled to free speech protection <coughs> of the Constitution. And if you're in Portland, Oregon on November 1st, you can attend a public forum paid for by the National Endowment for the Humanities titled, Should Hate Speech Be Protected? I worry that opinions and events like these are the tip of an iceberg that left to wander may end up uh, sinking free speech as we've known it. And I closed with a quote from a, or a couple of quotes from an op-ed piece that I, I did like. It was written by Jonathan Turley and published in the Washington Post on October 12 under the title, Shut Up and Play Nice, How the Western World is Limiting Free Speech. He says free speech is dying in the Western world. While most people still enjoy considerable freedom of expression, this right, once a near absolute, has become less defined and less dependable for those espousing controversial social, political, or religious views. The decline of free speech has not come from any single blow rather from thousands of paper cuts of well-intentioned exceptions designed to maintain social harmony. The near restrictions, uh, the professor writes, are forcing people to meet the demands of the lowest common denominator of accepted speech, using, usually using one of four rationales, that speech is blasphemous, that speech is hateful, that speech is discriminatory, uh, that speech is deceitful. He concludes by saying, the very right that laid the foundation for Western civilization is increasingly viewed as a nuisance, if not a threat. Whether speech is deemed inflammatory or hateful, 
or discriminatory or simply false, society is denying speech rights in the name of tolerance, enforcing mutual respect through categorical censorship. Do you think that it is inappropriate, Patrick, for the President of the United States to denounce an American who burns a Koran, leading to riots and death abroad, as part of a more general statement to the effect that we, we permit this under the First Amendment, but we deplore, as a nation, this behavior. Absolutely. I absolutely do. And I would say that it would particularly be the case with respect to innocence of Muslims, which so many wrote about without having watched it. I mean, to speak of it, it would be a, very, a cheesy video, a thing that, in fact, I would go further, if, in fact, something as amateurish as innocence of Muslims can inspire murder abroad, then really nothing we can do is going to make much difference because, uh, you know, it was just so appalling. And, and, uh, and so I, I do think it was appropriate to condemn the... the, the uh, it would be appropriate to condemn the, the, the speech where it is speech of the sort that was... That was uh, contained in the, the video uh, trailer. I, my concern is that there wasn't a strong enough statement about, I mean, I, I think it would be wor helpful to people around the world, and especially in countries without free speech, to hear th this government say, you know what, we didn't do this. This, th this is the, the way it works in this country. Individuals say what they want to say. And, and, and I think, again, it would be useful if, if people understood generally uh, how that works. I think it's truer to what we really are, than, and, um, and so that's, that's what I feel about.